Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Polemics on Protracted People's War. Proletarians of all countries unite. Again, in defense of the universality of people's war. Ard Kinera, Tien Folket Media. 26 June, 2019. On the 5th of June, 2019, founding chairman of the Communist Party of the Philippines, Jose Maria Sison, put forth a text on people's war and what he defines as industrialized capitalist countries. The day after, we made public a response to this article, and Sison has replied on the 7th of June. The reply is quite interesting. While the first text has to be read as a condemnation of the line of people's war being universally applicable, his second text is kind of a retreat. It is even less clear than the first article on the question of people's war. While the question is raised to the level of the title, it is not clearly answered in the article itself. Not directly and beyond doubt, that is. It is still impossible to read these texts as anything else than an attack on the universal applicability of protracted people's war, but the door is left with a tiny crack open. We know the extreme flexibility of many opportunists. They are able to wiggle themselves through the most narrow cracks, and thus they might pretend there is no contradiction between Sison's statement and upholding the necessity of people's war in the imperialist countries. As usual, they pretend two merges into one and want nothing more than to run away from the two-line struggle. Sison attacks the universality of protracted people's war. It is necessary to shut the door closed. If Sison does not do this himself, we have to do it for him. In his first text, Sison wrote, quote, The term people's war may be flexibly used to mean the necessary armed revolution by the people to overthrow the bourgeois state, end quote. And, quote, what ought to be protracted is the preparation for the armed revolution, end quote. And, quote, the revolution cannot win unless the capitalist system has been so gravely stricken by crisis that the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way. The people are desirous of revolutionary change, and the revolutionary party of the proletariat is strong enough to lead the revolution, end quote. Even though we have made this more condensed, the line put forth is quite clear. Since Sison is not in the habit of summing up his thoughts, we are forced to do it for him. In his view, people's war in the imperialist countries is nothing more than the armed revolution, and the war itself cannot be protracted, only the preparations for it. This is a position against the strategy of protracted people's war, but he does not clearly state it. If we misread, or, as Sison claims, quote, put every part of his article out of its clear context, end quote, he can at any time state clearly his position on the PCP's synthesis of Maoism and the understanding of people's war being universally applicable. It is impossible to read his article as anything else than dismissive of this doctrine, but if it does not represent his real stance, he might correct this at any time. We know this is not the first time he has dismissed the universality of people's war, but who knows, he might have changed his opinion. Dishonest Methods of Debate In his short follow-up note, dated 7th of June, Jose Maria Sison writes an answer to our text dated 6th of June. Again, Sison does not name anyone or answer anyone directly. Instead, he writes, quote, Waging protracted people's war in any industrial capitalist country is not a matter of dogmatically asserting it or putting every part of my article out of its clear context, end quote. We would state that the question of people's war, or any other key question in our ideology, neither should be a matter of passive-aggressive statements that do not address or even directly quote the ones you call dogmatists. In and of itself, it is of no greater importance that Sison answer in our text directly, but in the name of intellectual and, more importantly, revolutionary honesty, 
in the name of Leninist clarity, he should at least briefly name the Communist Party of Peru, quote, at least some of their documents, or refer to any one of the documents and statements put forth by other Marxist-Leninist-Maoist parties and organizations. He does not, and it speaks volumes on the methods of CISOM. What is old and what is new? Sison writes, quote, For many decades already, I have heard of the notion or threat to wage a protracted people's war in imperialist countries, but to this day I have not seen any Maoist party proclaiming and actually starting it in any imperialist country, end quote. And, quote, In fact, I am not aware of any Maoist party in an industrially developed capitalist country strong enough to lead any armed revolution with the participation of any sizable proletarian masses in the industrial and service sectors of the economy. End quote. This could be a weighty argument if it was not for the fact that neither can he show us any Maoist party not adhering to the strategy of people's war and being of such quantity and quality. Even if we expand the period to a hundred years, there is no example of a communist party leading armed revolution in the imperialist countries and not adhering to people's war strategy. The only such struggles, led by communist parties, have taken the form of national liberation war, in essence, people's war. Sison is tired of the talk and notion of waging people's war, since he has heard of it in decades we dare say, since the Communist Party of Peru established this as a Maoist principle in 1980 as the first only Maoist party in the world, but he seems to be one of those that are never tired of the protracted legal accumulation of forces, in weight and want of the cataclysm of economical, political, and military crisis of capitalism, making relations, quote, ripe for revolution, end quote. The strategy of protracted legal accumulation to the brink of crisis and revolution is an old strategy. It has been, and still is, the totally dominating strategy of the left in Europe. Of all Trotskyite, Hojaite, and Brezhnevite deviating parties and organizations in Europe. Even of all, or almost all, that adhere to Mao Zedong thought, and of the seemingly endless flora and variations of so-called revolutionaries. The Maoist principle that upholds protracted people's war, that lifts the asymmetric warfare of the proletariat and all oppressed masses up from the tactical level to the strategic, that establish, in theory, the universality of people's war in each and every country of the world, is only established with the summation and synthesis of Maoism done by Chairman Gonzalo and the Communist Party of Peru. It was only part of doctrine since 1980 and especially since the general political line of the Communist Party of Peru was established in 1988. It is thus quite new. And by then, it was the only one single party in the world adhering to this line. Sison is already tired of this notion, but it is not a baseless speculation to make that for him the synthesis established by the PCP was tiresome from the beginning. We make the assumption and Sison is free to correct us if the assumption is wrong, that he never viewed the universality of protracted people's war as correct or applicable, even when this was new to him. The year's passing is not the most important, but the content. And it seems clear that the one that rejects the new and clings to the old is Sison himself. Sison is painting a picture of people's war strategy being something old in the imperialist countries, but we know it is not so. Upholding this strategy, and making it part of the general line for revolution, is very new in the imperialist countries. The Revolutionary Internationalist Movement, RIM, sanctioned it in its statement of 1993, but not wholeheartedly. The revisionist Avakian never adhered to it in a real way, or with the same understanding as the PCP. It is true that the PCP fought for this line since they first adopted it, but it is falsehood to portray it as something old in the revolutionary movement of the West. The new is born fragile. Amongst the Rim parties and the Marxist-Leninists supporting the People's Wars, there were several contending lines in the 1990s, and not a clear dominance of Maoism proper. 
when real Marxist-Leninist-Maoist, principally Maoist, organizations and parties are now emerging in imperialist countries, it is with the characteristics of something new being born. In its youthfulness, it has all the features of the new. It is small, it does not have a long track record, it does not have all the quantitative mass that is the only thing that impresses the opportunist. But it has something much more important. It is developing, it is growing, it has the future ahead of it, while revisionism is old, rotten, and only ripe for the dustbin. When we speak of Maoism and the strategy of people's war in the imperialist countries, we must bear in mind the words of Chairman Gonzalo when he speaks of the new power in the line of construction of the PCP. Quote, Comrades, it will be born fragile, weak, because it will be new. But its destiny is to develop itself through change, through variation, through fragility, like a tender sapling. End quote. Sison paints his picture of reality upside down and confuses the tender light of dawn with the shades of dusk. He might have been seated in the first row, listening to the first tuning of instruments, and now he thinks the show is over, before the orchestra has even begun to perform the prelude. On the Political Preparation of People's War Sison states, quote, there is no protracted people's war of any kind going on in any industrial capitalist country. No serious preparations for it are being made. It will take at least some years to prepare and to realize the start of such armed revolution of the people. End quote. We cannot really address the statement of no preparations being made. This might be true. It might not. But Sison's statement clearly shows that if anyone were to make such preparations, they should never tell Sison, since he feels obliged to inform the whole world of any such preparations and the seriousness of them. The other two statements we agree on, at least for the most part. No Maoist Communist Party is leading a protracted people's war in the imperialist countries today, and such people's war would have to be prepared for, quote, at least some years, end quote. On the content of such preparations of war, the author of this text would refer to the preparations made by the Communist Party of Peru, which, in short form, is presented in the military line of the party. We would again refer to the excellent article from the editorial board of the German magazine Klassenstandpunkt, People's War, The Sole Path to Liberation. We also could refer to some of Lenin's texts, amongst them the article Guerrilla Warfare, where he writes, quote, In a period of civil war, the ideal party of the proletariat is a fighting party. This is absolutely incontrovertible, end quote. And, quote, Every military action in any war, to a certain extent, disorganizes the ranks of the fighters. But this does not mean that one must not fight. It means that one must learn to fight. That is all, end quote. This article of Lenin has clear limitations. The ideology of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism has moved on since 1906. But we emphasize on the point of one must learn to fight. And on the quotation of Mao Zedong, stating that one must learn war by waging war. The Communist Party of Brazil, Red Faction, has written a new article on the militarization of the Communist Parties. Lenin and the Militarized Communist Party, PCB-FV, and this article has been translated and publicized in Dem Volke Dienen. They have also made public other important articles on the topic. We know these articles and excerpts are not sufficient, but it is a beginning, and there is much more to be read and said on the question, and more importantly, there is more to be done. The whole of the general political line of the PCP and the complete body of work of Chairman Gonzalo should be studied by revolutionaries today. It is stated that the strategy of people's war is established mainly by Mao Zedong, and his works must be studied. And, as the PCP has stated, the experiences of armed struggle in Europe should be studied, analyzed, and synthesized. We would, especially amongst these, emphasize the protracted war of independence fought in Ireland. 
This war in its modern form has been waged without stop for over 100 years, with its ups and downs, with its ebb and flow, with its victories and defeats, but never stopping. The traders in the Sinn Féin leadership tried once again to liquidate it in the 1990s, but still the war is continuing. In an industrialized, advanced capitalist country, subjugated by one of the most powerful imperialists in the world. We uphold that the universality of people's war was established in the People's War of Peru, and that the question in the imperialist countries is not to establish the doctrine, but to apply it creatively on the specific conditions in the specific countries. The theory cannot make any more significant leaps solely in the realm of theoretical science, but it must do so in the midst of people's war. It is a very common way of debating, a method we have often encountered, to demand every minor question, even the most remote and hypothetical, to be answered before one can act on the information we already have. Have we not met a seemingly endless thread of questions on how every aspect of life will be organized in the future communist society? As if the bourgeoisie had every such question of capitalism sorted out before they led the charge on the Bastille. Cisson has similar demands, and also he distorts the whole problem. It is posed like it is something completely different to wage war in imperialist countries than in the oppressed countries. As if war had no universal laws, and a gun worked in a different way in Europe than in Asia. Of course, one has to put emphasis on the specific conditions of specific countries. There are qualitative differences between a country like England and the country of the Philippines. Sison might actually also have pointed to some of these as they are obvious. On the Practical Preparations of People's War Sison writes, quote, A people's war of whatever duration and scale is possible in the industrial capitalist country only after a period of preparations of ideological work, political education and mass work, party and mass organizing, clandestine accumulation of arms, political military training, and Bolshevik-style penetration of the reactionary armed forces. Such preparations or suggestions thereof should not be disdained or begrudged, end quote. We would claim that no one has disdained or begrudged preparations of this character, at least not ourselves. Though we do not blindly accept the clandestine accumulation of arms suggested by Sison. The People's War of Peru and the People's War in other countries have not proceeded as such, nor with the penetration of the reactionary armed forces. The seizure of weapons has mainly been part of the People's War in its initiation and development, and not its preparation. The same is to be said of the penetration of the armed forces. But one must also emphasize the concrete situation of the Russian armed forces during the First World War being completely different from the imperialist armies of Europe and North America today, and thus the military line of penetration cannot be applied in a Bolshevik style at least not without a great deal of adjustment to the concrete conditions. And on this question, one must apply the doctrine of the PCP when they state the generated organisms as being principal and the penetration of other organizations as being secondary. The penetration of the reactionary armed forces is secondary to generating the People's Army under the sole leadership of the militarized Communist Party. The Importance of Combating Confusion and Understanding War as Politics with Bloodshed The question of preparations before the People's War, and the first stage of it, are easily confused, with or without ill will. If one denies, or just does not take into account, the protractedness of the People's War, one can postpone it to the distant future where all objective conditions are ripe. If one does not understand the bloodshed of war, if one is not clear on the military aspect, one might negate the war for protracted preparations without any real prospect of waging war. One might even, as we have experienced in Norway, and maybe also Italy, develop a right opportunist line that portrays the protracted preparations as part of the people's war itself. It is similar to experiences in several European countries, 
where adherence to Mao Zedong thought, or even Maoism, have dressed the political activities in the vocabulary of war. In itself not an error, it becomes an enormous error if this negates the bloodshed and confuses the very concept of war with just simply politics. Parts of guerrilla warfare might be applied in all realms of politics. We might find similarities to this when Sun Tzu's eternal work, Art of War, is rewritten and adopted for the use of stockbrokers and business people. This is also true for the proletarian military strategy. Many of the laws and concepts of this might be applied in political strategy as well. But we must emphasize the thesis of Clausewitz that war is the continuation of politics by other means, and the truth of Mao Zedong that politics is war without bloodshed, while war is politics with bloodshed. The political work, part of preparing for people's war, is not war, it is simply politics. The strategy of universality of people's war is not a question of simply changing the definitions and words while one continues the old practice of protracted legal accumulation of forces. The question of people's war is a matter of accepting that in all countries, the revolution will take the form of protracted people's war, developed from its limited, undeveloped, and unadvanced beginning, but still developed as warfare proper, and not simply as the endless preparation through legal political work primarily, as we have seen in practice, through elections, trade unions, and NGO work. In the preparations for people's war, everything must be for the people's war. We know the practice of parties and organizations with the same position as Sison. We know that the talk of armed revolution is mere talk. We know they do not even study military theory. We know they only pay lip service to revolution, we know this to be true. Even though many of them have no ill will, no sinister agenda, they are only trapped in the ideological framework of revisionism and especially dogmatic revisionism. They might talk the talk, but they do not walk the walk. Sison takes the part of a crass judge when he makes the claim notions have been upheld for decades without even any serious preparations, but what really deserves a crass judgment is the track record of the accumulationists. They do not adhere to Maoism as it was defined for the first time. They do not have a real answer for how to make revolution. They can only fall back to the century-old practice of protracted legal struggle and the confines of parliamentarism and trade unionism. Also, no war of the masses can be fought without propaganda or without ideological and political schooling. The question of line is the most important, and secondly, the question of a solid organization to bring the line into practical life, and key in this is the question of cadres. The question of propaganda is essential to create popular opinion and also to bring more people into the organizations, but this cannot only be propaganda against imperialism and capitalism. It must also be propaganda for the people's war. This cannot be done if the question is confused by the revolutionaries themselves by constantly leaving the door half open for every imagined possibility or always postponing the question of war, that is, revolution. Sison advocates right opportunist stagism counter to the Communist Manifesto. Sison writes, quote, it is only a left opportunist, a fake Maoist, or even an agent provocateur who has disdain for the lasting admonition of the Communist Manifesto to win the battle for democracy against the bourgeois class dictatorship, and who clamors for proclaiming and starting a people's war in an industrial capitalist country without the necessary preparations of the subjective forces and the favorable objective conditions that I have mentioned." End quote. One might say that the cat is out of the bag. Sison doubles down and smears others with fake Maoist and even a Jean provocateur without any basis for such claim. Again, his wording is sinister. He speaks of misrepresentation in his first paragraph. But clearly, everyone that has read our former article has seen no claim that people's war should start without the necessary preparations. 
his claim of others' disdain for the Communist Manifesto is also completely sinister. Sison wrote in his first text, on the question of people's war in industrial capitalist countries, quote, Even if the material foundation for socialism exists in capitalism, the proletariat must first defeat fascism, thus winning the battle for democracy before socialism can triumph, end quote. In context, this can only be read as Sison advocating a form of stagism. The thesis being, and we know it very well from many right opportunists, but also many an honest revolutionary, that in order to prevent revolution, the bourgeoisie will apply fascism, and then the first stage of struggle becomes the democratic struggle against fascism, winning this before entering the stage of socialist revolution. But this has nothing to do with the Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels write, quote, We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy, end quote. Marx and Engels thus claim the necessity of establishing the proletarian dictatorship as precondition to win the battle of democracy. To raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class is to establish socialism, and thus this is winning the battle of democracy. Penetrating further into this question, it is revealed how Sison has fallen into stagism of a non-Marxist type. It is similar to the anti-monopoly coalition strategy proposed by the Moscow revisionists and their satellites in Europe. This strategy is simply summarized as the first stage being coalition against monopoly capital and wrestling the power from their hands, and then, in the second stage, waging socialist revolution against capitalism. This is the programmatic line of the revisionist Communist Party of Norway, and it is not so different in essence from the Sison line of first winning the battle of democracy by defeating fascism, and then, secondly, socialism can triumph. Our position is that fascism can only be defeated in the midst of people's war, and winning the battle of democracy, and thus winning the battle of state power, can only be done by and through the socialist revolution, that is, the people's war, and not in some pre-stage to this. More on the necessity of militarized Maoist communist parties and protracted people's war. We agree, and every revolutionary would, that people's war must be prepared by ideological, political, and organizational work and political military training. Just as we agree that revolutionaries must apply both the open and legal, as well as the clandestine and non-legal forms of struggle and methods of developing the revolutionary struggle. But guided by Maoism, we adhere to the doctrine of revolutionary war being the highest form of class struggle and the sole way of taking power. This must demand the full attention of the communists to the military question, to preparing and developing people's war. It cannot be treated, like every right opportunist in reality does, as the last point on the agenda, the last thought added as if it was almost forgotten. Further, it demands a communist party organized for the sole purpose of waging people's war. It is impossible for a party organized in total legality to develop any clandestine and non-legal forms of struggle. To propose such a legalist organization to take up non-legal forms of struggle is, in reality, the work of an agent provocateur. Sison is spewing such words against the Maoists, but with his policy of not naming names or referring to documents, he can talk about the pitfalls of the left and right opportunist, the fake Maoist or the agent, with a slippery style of not accusing anyone of having to prove anything. It is a form of intellectual dishonesty which exposes Sison himself more than anyone else. To be clear, to be Maoist is to adhere to the universality of protracted people's war. It means to defend and apply this strategy, principally applying it. To apply people's war, one must apply the universally applicable contributions of Chairman Gonzalo, especially the concept of the militarized Communist Party and the concentric construction of the party, the army, and the front new state. The Communist Party is core and center. It is the highest form of proletarian class organization, 
and it has to be militarized to be able to lead a people's war. The Communist Party of Peru writes in its military line, quote, The Third Moment, 1980 to the Present The party begins to lead the people's war. Its military line is formed with the application and development of the road. This third moment has four milestones. 1. Definition 2. Preparation 3. Initiation and 4. Development of the guerrilla war, end quote. The same is universal for every people's war. It must firstly be defined, then prepared, then initiated, then developed. To clearly define it, one must wage two-line struggle against all old opportunism. As the PCP refers to Engels' thesis in the mass line of the party, quote, In a country with such an old political and workers' movement, there is always a colossal heap of garbage inherited by tradition that must be cleaned step by step, end quote. The theory of protracted legal accumulation is part of this colossal heap of garbage. It has to be swept away by the broom of Maoism. As all old traditions, it will reappear in new forms, even take the form of Maoism. This has been a characteristic of the development of the proletarian ideology every step of the way. Revisionism was rebranded as Marxism, and has later been rebranded as Marxism-Leninism, and today it is rebranded as Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. Why should it be any different today? It should not. It could not. It has to be this way. So this is nothing to be afraid or surprised of. We are in favor of active ideological struggle. We fear it not, and we do not fear revisionism. Even when it is attempted to smuggle into the movement, or when comrades blindly introduce it because they have not understood its revisionist content and are mesmerized by its shiny and polished surface. Finally, none amongst the newest and youngest Maoist organizations should be arrogant in this matter, for have we not been struggling with such questions ourselves? The communist attitude is fearless in the two-line struggle, but at the same time, humble. Reaching new highs, one must be careful not to, as we say, pull the ladder up after us. We must not condemn or behave arrogantly against comrades or friends or masses, who are now where we were a short time ago, while we believe we have moved further. As the Communist Party of Brazil, Red Fraction, has quoted from Chairman Mao, combat liquidationism and unite the ICM under Maoism and the People's War, about the CMPA critique of the Joint Declaration of 1 May 2018, PCBFV, we must have two hands when we deal with these questions. On the one hand, we struggle against the incorrect lines. On the other hand, we wish all honest revolutionaries to join us if they do away with former mistakes. Insight needs to be conquered. Unity must be conquered. For the newborn, every breath and heartbeat is fought for. Life is struggle, and so the struggling movement is living, vibrantly, and the movement that shies away from struggle to promote unprincipled unity is dying and decaying. Forward to the unification of the international communist movement under Maoism and People's War. Define, prepare, initiate, and develop People's War in each and every country. People's War Until Communism On the So-Called Universality of Protracted People's War Andy Belisario, PRISM 31 August, 2019 Introductory Note Two articles by a certain Ard Kinera defend and apply the universality of protracted people's war and again in defense of the universality of people's war, have been posted respectively on 6 June 2019 and 26 June 2019 in response to José María Sison's two articles on the same subject. Quinera's articles were posted originally on the TFM site and reposted the same day on the Democracy and Class Struggle site. Since Quinera is raring for direct polemics on the question and feels shortchanged by Sison's replies, I'll indulge him. Before I comment on his articles, let me pose the question as directly as possible. 
is Mao's strategy or theory of protracted people's war, one that has universal validity in the present era, and particular applicability in capitalist countries? Kinera will most probably answer a definitive yes, while I say no generally, with certain qualifications and clarifications that will be presented further below. I will also show that Kinera is wrong not only on this question, but on a number of related questions, particularly raised in his polemics with Sison. Protracted People's War vis-à-vis -vis People's War as a generic term. Kinera asserts, quote, Maoism puts forward the universality of People's War strategy, puts this forward as the sole military strategy of the international proletariat, applicable in each and every country, applied concretely in accordance to the different concrete conditions, end quote. In another article, he says in no uncertain terms, quote, to be Maoist is to adhere to the universality of protracted people's war, end quote. He also says, quote, The Maoist principle that upholds protracted people's war, that established in theory the universality of people's war in each and every country of the world, is only established with a summation and synthesis of Maoism done by Chairman Gonzalo and the Communist Party of Peru. It was only part of doctrine since 1980, and especially since the general political line of the Peruvian Communist Party was established in 1988. It is thus quite new, and by then it was only one single party in the world adhering to this line, end quote. Take note that in his two articles, Kinera sometimes uses the term protracted people's war, and at other times simply people's war. But it's clear, especially when he argues versus Sison, that he treats the two as interchangeable terms in the context of the theory's universality. This is a crucial weakness in Kinera's arguments, since the protracted character of the people's wars that liberated China and Vietnam has a precise socio-economic context and political military meaning for agrarian or semi-feudal countries that are oppressed by imperialism as colonies or semi-colonies. It is not merely expressed in numbers of years that armed revolutions in industrial countries could quantitatively measure up to. Kinera also implies that the application of this universal theory of people's war in different countries is a matter of simply, quote, being flexible in tactics, end quote. Ergo, it is not a question of difference in strategic line. This is another flaw, because it implies that CPs need only to concern themselves with tactics and no longer need to define their own strategies based on the particularity of their own countries, because, after all, their dear Gonzalo has already defined the Maoist sole military strategy of PPW for them. The True Universality of People's War The true universality of the term and concept of people's war is that of the justness and historic role of armed revolution everywhere throughout the world when waged by exploited and oppressed classes to overthrow exploiter and oppressor classes. Marx and Engels had long developed this theory on the necessity of armed revolution by the masses of toiling people, led by the working class, further clarifying the need to smash the existing bourgeois state machinery and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat in order to pursue and complete the socialist revolution. The basic principles of armed revolution by the proletariat and other allied classes were further elaborated by Lenin in his many works. So, yes, in this sense, there should be no debate about the universal applicability of people's war in all countries ruled by the big bourgeoisie and its reactionary allies. Had Kinera kept his polemics within these bounds, about people's war being the equivalent of armed revolution, then there would be essentially no debate on this question. However, Kinera glosses over two important corollaries to this fundamental principle of Marxism-Leninism. First, his arguments assume, even though not directly, that a revolutionary situation currently, or perennially, exists in all countries. Therefore, all communist parties, CPs, if they are truly engaged in revolution, must adopt a corresponding military strategy and place armed struggle on their practical work agenda. And second, 
He insists that the Maoist strategy of protracted people's war is applicable to industrial capitalist countries. I will take these two corollary questions separately. On the concept of revolutionary situations. While the fundamental task of armed revolution is axiomatic for all Marxist-Leninist parties, not just Maoist parties, it is not a dogmatic imposition that disregards concrete conditions. It doesn't oblige all these parties to adopt armed struggle as the main form of struggle in their countries, to implement a corresponding military strategy for seizing political power, and to immediately start combat preparations and build combat formations. The crucial question to ask is this. Is there a developing revolutionary situation in the country or not? If there is no such revolutionary situation on the horizon, then it will be putschist, if not suicidal, for a party to mobilize an army and wage armed struggle in an attempt to seize political power. If there is such a developing situation, then preparing for armed struggle and mobilizing all forces under the correct military strategy certainly becomes an urgent and practical question. The concept of revolutionary situations should be familiar to anyone who seriously studies Lenin's works. From 1905 to 06 onward, Lenin had identified and described in detail the basic elements of a revolutionary situation through a close study of the 1905 revolution. He further deepened his grasp of the concept in 1917. In Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, 1920, he summarized the necessary conditions for the existence of such a situation. Quote, The fundamental law of revolution, which has been confirmed by all revolutions, and particularly by all three Russian revolutions in the 20th century, is as follows. It is not enough for revolution that the exploited and oppressed masses should understand the impossibility of living in the old way and demand changes. What is required for revolution is that the exploiters should not be able to live and rule in the old way. Only when the lower classes do not want the old way, and when the upper classes cannot carry on in the old way, can revolution win. This truth may be expressed in other words. Revolution is impossible without a nationwide crisis, affecting both the exploited and the exploiters. It follows that revolution requires, firstly, that a majority of the workers, or at least a majority of the class-conscious, thinking, and politically active workers, should fully understand that revolution is necessary and be ready to sacrifice their lives for it. Secondly, that the ruling classes should be passing through a governmental crisis which would draw even the most backward masses into politics. A symptom of every real revolution is a rapid tenfold or even hundredfold increase in the number of representatives of the toiling and oppressed masses, who have hitherto been apathetic, capable of waging the political struggle, weaken the government, and make it possible for the revolutionaries to overthrow it rapidly." End quote. Lenin, of course, assumed the existence of a proletarian revolutionary party and its correct leadership of the masses as an additional necessary condition for such a revolution to advance and win victory. Sison reiterates this basic Leninist view when he says, in Basic Principles of Marxism-Leninism, a primer, 1981-82, quote, In either capitalist or semi-feudal countries, armed revolution is justified and is likely to succeed when objective conditions favor it and the subjective factors of the revolution are strong enough. Objective conditions refer to the situation of the ruling system. A political and economic crisis of that system can become so serious as to violently split the ruling class and prevent it from ruling in the old way. The ruling clique engages in open terror against a wide range of people and is extremely isolated. The people in general, including those unorganized, are disgusted with the system and are desirous of changing it. The subjective factors of the revolution refer to the conscious and organized forces of the revolution. These are the revolutionary party, the mass organizations, armed contingent, and so on. To gauge their strength fully, one has to consider their ideological, political, and organized status and capabilities. 
the objective conditions are primary over the subjective factors. The former arise ahead of the latter and serve as the basis for the development of the revolutionary forces. The Communist Party cannot be accused of inventing or causing the political and economic crisis of the bourgeois ruling system." End quote. In short, an armed revolution can only be justified and possible when objective conditions favor it. Serious political and economic crisis and violent splits among the ruling class, who can no longer rule in the old way, while the broad masses are disgusted with the system and no longer want to live in the old way. But the proletarian party must do its work well to develop the revolutionary forces, by undertaking serious and long-term preparations even before the revolutionary situation sets in. The problem with Kinera is that he disregards the matter of objective conditions in specific countries, the level of crisis, the political behavior of the ruling classes, the range of responses by various political forces, the level of consciousness and readiness for struggle of the masses, and thus, a realistic evaluation of whether a revolutionary situation really exists or is at least a developing trend. Mao on the Strategy of Protracted People's War From 1917 all the way through the 1940s, Lenin and Stalin, through their writings and through the Comintern, had consistently educated the CPs and revolutionaries of their time about formulating and implementing the correct strategy and tactics appropriate to the class structure, history, balance of forces, and concrete conditions of their corresponding countries. Lenin, Stalin, and the Comintern warned the other CPs, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, of the danger of left-wing infantilism, brash insurrectionism, and military adventurism, especially since the victories of the Bolshevik Party and the young Soviet state inspired these other CPs to emulate and replicate, sometimes dogmatically, the Russian model, often to reject the painstaking and seemingly non-revolutionary work within bourgeois parliament, reactionary trade unions, and the like. The Chinese Communist Party, CCP, especially under Mao, had learned and benefited much from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, CPSU, and Comintern. So at first, they followed the strategy and overall tactics of the Russian Revolution. Due to the great differences between Russia, circa 1900 to 1920s, and China, circa 1920s to 1940s, however, the Mao-led CCP eventually developed its own strategy and tactics, which would lead to nationwide victory 22 years later and would be emulated by other CPs in many countries under the popular rubric of Protracted People's War, PPW. The People's War in China's New Democratic Revolution had fundamental commonalities with the 1917 October Revolution, but followed a distinctive strategy that was, in many ways, the latter's opposite. The most crucial difference was that in contrast to capitalist Russia, the main force in semi-feudal China was the peasantry in its huge numbers, and agrarian revolution was the main content. This meant that the main area for developing red political power was in the vast rural areas, while the ruling reactionary regimes could entrench themselves for quite some time in the cities. There was indeed in China, throughout the first half of the 20th century, an increasingly favorable revolutionary situation as defined by Lenin in 1920. But still, the armed revolution had to start with small and weak forces relative to the size and strength of the counter-revolutionary forces. The process of overcoming the tremendous unevenness, accumulating strength in the countryside, and eating up the enemy forces piece by piece, would take some time before the revolutionary forces were ready to take the cities and win nationwide victory. It was on such a comprehensive basis that Mao arrived at the necessary conclusion that, when compared to the relatively rapid process of armed seizure of political power in Russia, the process in China would be more protracted. This is the substantial meaning of protractedness, not merely the number of years of war. Mao would later elaborate this main theme to clarify other aspects specific to China's PPW, such as the role and principles of guerrilla warfare, army building, base building, 
and the three strategic stages of the war. The Maoist strategy of PPW and many of its operational and tactical principles clearly remain applicable and flexible enough to be adopted further to the different conditions in various countries that are semi-feudal or principally pre-industrial due to imperialist rule and plunder. On this, there is no fundamental question, and we will not dwell much further on this point. On Armed Struggle in Capitalist Countries The question, however, remains. What should be the strategy and tactics for armed revolution in capitalist countries? Will the Maoist strategy of PPW also apply? Sison rightfully says a different non-PPW strategy would apply. But Kinera insists that Maoist PPW strategy applies, even as he sometimes drops the term protracted. Quote, Maoists define revolution just simply as people's war universally applicable also in the imperialist and mainly urbanized countries." End quote. Since Kinera and his idol Gonzalo invoke Maoism as their framework, let us then go back to what Mao actually said on the matter. We quote from Mao's Problems of War and Strategy, written in 1938, as a well-known pillar of his military writings and major source of PPW theory. Quote, the seizure of power by the armed force, the settlement of the issue by war, is the central task in the highest form of revolution. This Marxist-Leninist principle of revolution holds good universally, for China and for all other countries. But while the principle remains the same, its application by the party of the proletariat finds expression in varying ways according to the varying conditions. Internally, Capitalist countries practice bourgeois democracy, not feudalism, when they are not fascist or not at war. In their external relations, they are not oppressed by, but themselves oppress, other nations. Because of these characteristics, it is the task of the party of the proletariat in the capitalist countries to educate the workers and build up strength through a long period of legal struggle, and thus prepare for the final overthrow of capitalism. In these countries, the question is one of long legal struggle, of utilizing parliament as a platform, of economic and political strikes, of organizing trade unions and educating the workers. There, the form of organization is legal and the form of struggle bloodless, non-military. On the issue of war, the communist parties in the capitalist countries oppose the imperialist wars waged by their own countries. If such wars occur, the policy of these parties is to bring about the defeat of the reactionary governments of their own countries. The one war that they want to fight is the civil war for which they are preparing. But this insurrection and war should not be launched until the bourgeoisie becomes really helpless, until the majority of the proletariat are determined to rise in arms and fight, and until the rural masses are giving willing help to the proletariat. And when the time comes to launch such an insurrection and war, the first step will be to seize the cities and then advance into the countryside, and not the other way about. All this has been done by communist parties in capitalist countries, and it has been proved correct by the October Revolution in Russia." End quote. We repeat and underscore what Mao said in no uncertain terms. The task of the proletarian party in the capitalist countries is, quote, to educate the workers and build up strength through a long period of legal struggle, of utilizing parliament as a platform, of economic and political strikes, of organizing trade unions. There, the form of organization is legal and the form of struggle bloodless, non-military. And when the time comes to launch such an insurrection and war, the first step will be to seize the cities and then advance into the countryside." End quote. The contrast is stark as day and night. Mao says that PPW does not apply to capitalist countries, quote, when they are not fascist or not at war, end quote, while Kinera insists it does. Mao, reiterating Lenin on the same question, says that the way to build mass strength towards eventual armed insurrection in capitalist countries is through a long period of legal struggle. Quite the opposite, Kinera says this, 
Petrograd model is a, quote, tired old strategy, end quote. On this point alone, Kinera's entire house of cards about the universality of protracted people's war collapses into a heap. He claims to be Maoist, but doesn't really get Mao's teachings. He is shown up to be an infantile Maoist, or worse, a fake Maoist. The Specific Characteristics of People's War in Capitalist Countries In his article on the same question, Sison rightfully asserts, quote, In industrial capitalist countries, the proletarian revolutionaries cannot begin the revolutionary war with a small and weak people's army in the countryside, and hope to use the wide space and indefinite time in the countryside to sustain the war, end quote. He thus warns of the folly of applying the PPW strategy, surrounding the cities from the countryside, in capitalist countries. Kinera says, quote, Who made this the defining factor of people's war? Not the Communist Party of Peru, at least. It is crystal clear from all Maoists that the path of surrounding the cities is not a universal law of PPW, end quote. Kinera's problem is that he swallows Gonzalo's distorted definition of Maoism and PPW, forgets to check with Mao's original military writings and theory about PPW, and then complains, on that hopelessly confused basis, that Sison is making things up about the factors for a successful people's war. Sison's point is that in the highly urbanized and other highly developed areas of capitalist countries, under current conditions, when there is no full-scale war or revolutionary crisis, a people's army that launches tactical offensives with no sizable mass base, at least equivalent to rural guerrilla bases in such countries as China and Vietnam, will be hard-pressed to counter-maneuver, employ guerrilla tactics, retain initiative, and hit back at the enemy's weak points, and much less be able to consolidate and expand their bases. In the most realistic and practical terms, such a people's army cannot sustain itself and continue to grow into bigger formations that combine military work, political work, and production work, as Mao defined the tasks of a people's army. Such a people's army can only do so when other crucial factors favorable to the armed revolution's advance are at play, such as an intense crisis that has greatly weakened the enemy state and demoralized its rank and file extensive and expanding political base engaged in mobilizing the masses of toiling people, and of course, correct party leadership. Sison rightly asserts, quote, As soon as that army, in a capitalist country, dares to launch the first tactical offensive, it will be overwhelmed by the huge armed forces and the highly unified economic, communications, and transport system of the monopoly bourgeoisie, end quote. Kinera counter-argues that Quote, this is simply not true, end quote. Then he proceeds to mention Italy's Brigada Rossa, Germany's Red Army Faction, Japan's JRA, the U.S. Weatherman Underground, and the Black Liberation Army, the Basque TA, and, quote, several active armed groups in Ireland, end quote, all of which continued to operate for a number of years before they folded up. He explains their failure this way, quote, most of these groups were not armed with the omnipotent ideology of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. They were not led by a militarized Maoist Communist Party. In most cases, the groups capitulated due to loss of morale or lack of ideology in political leadership. That is true of many of these groups, end quote. In short, Kinera focuses exclusively on subjective factors for the failures, e.g. loss of morale, or lack of ideology and political leadership by a militarized Maoist CP. He avoids giving weight to the objective factors, which were stressed by Lenin and Mao. In nearly all cases he mentioned, there were no favorable objective conditions for an armed revolution to advance and win, in addition to big gaps in preparing the masses through open and underground channels for eventual armed struggle. It remains for genuine Marxist-Leninist ML, or Marxist-Leninist-Maoist, MLM, parties, certainly not Kinera and his Gonzaloite friends with their militarized CP mindset, to make comprehensive summings up to explain the eventual failures and draw lessons. 
on Kinera's vision of PPW and capitalist countries. But let us allow Kinera another chance to describe in detail his Maoist PPW strategy for capitalist countries. If it is to be a protracted people's war, as in Mao's China and Ho's Vietnam, then where in the social and geographic terrain of a capitalist country, and how exactly, will the organs of revolutionary political power be organized and sustained? Remember that the essence of protracted people's war is not simply to maintain fighting teams that use guns, which the fascists, the mafia, and conspiratorial terrorists also do, but to mobilize the masses in the armed struggle in order to dismantle the bourgeois reactionary state machinery, especially its armed forces, step by step, and in likewise fashion, to build the revolutionary state machinery and use it to defend the people's gains. If it is to be a genuine revolutionary war, and not just idle prattle or showing militancy in street battles against the police, what is to be the main form that war is going to take? Armed insurrection in the cities? Pockets of guerrilla-slash-partisan warfare in popular areas that will either grow into or support wider theaters of regular mobile warfare, or grow into or support armed insurrections? What types of military formations will be built and deployed, and from which main social class? The Bolsheviks in Lenin's time, the CCP in Mao's time, and the Communist Party of the Philippines in the current period went into extensive and detailed description of their strategic, operational, and tactical principles in order to flesh out their theory and vision of armed revolution. Since Kinera disdains, quote, hiding our intent from the masses, end quote, then this is his chance to explain his own version of Maoist military strategy and tactics in detail. My guess is that it will be a revised edition of Gonzalo's Peru circa 1988, transplanted to current-day Europe but Kinera should further expound. On the Military Theory of the International Proletariat Despite Kinera's misplaced flattery, Mao was not the original proponent or first theorist of People's War as, quote, the military theory of the international proletariat, end quote. For Kinera, or his idol Gonzalo, to make this claim is a disservice to other great communist leaders who made equally valuable contributions to the proletariat's military theory and practice, as expressed in the strategic, operational, and tactical principles that they adopted for their respective revolutions and are now available for study and creative application by all revolutionaries of the world. Marx, and especially Engels, closely studied military theory based on existing armies and military doctrines of their time actual wars and battles not just among European states, but in the mass uprisings of the 1848 Revolution, the 1871 Paris Commune, and the anti-colonial insurrections in Asia. Lenin led the Bolsheviks in turning the principles he expounded, e.g. in State and Revolution, into the practical tasks of organizing the Bolsheviks' armed uprising, of building the Red Army from partisan units and reorganized Tsarist troops, and of organizing Soviet power in the many localities wrested from the white armies. Stalin shared his rich experience acquired as a field commander in the Civil War and encouraged other Soviet commanders to draw from their experience of partisan warfare, e.g. a growing understanding of deep operations with a peasant rear in a long war, and systematized these in the fledgling institutes of military science and training. Mao, of course, made immense contributions to proletarian military theory based on his vast experience in the long years of Chinese Revolution, as did Ho Chi Minh, Lei Zuan, and Vo Nguyen Zap, in the case of the Vietnamese Revolution, and Si Son in the case of the Philippine Revolution. All of them successfully applied proletarian military theory to practical questions of people's war in their respective countries, and in the process enriched such theory. However, these communist leaders did not set out to synthesize a universally applicable theory on how to wage armed revolution, or forge some military theory of the international proletariat, as Kinera claims Gonzalo had done. In fact, these great leaders repeatedly emphasized concrete analysis of concrete conditions, and carefully applied theory to grapple with the specific characteristics of their own countries 
and solve concrete problems of their own revolutions. In one line of argumentation, Kinera even cites Thomas Marx, a U.S. counterinsurgency expert, to show that a bourgeois reactionary expert agrees with his distortions about the content and value of Maoist military strategy. Both Kinera and Marx blowed up notions of asymmetric warfare into some sort of universal Maoist principle. In the process, they set aside the historically specific class basis of Mao's PPW strategy, a rural peasant war led by the proletariat, and its concrete social setting, semi-feudal country oppressed by imperialism. To strengthen his weak arguments about the universality of PPW, Kinera even goes as far as to arrogantly claim, quote, what bourgeois experts, like Marx, understand, many revolutionaries fail to grasp, end quote. In another line of argumentation, Kinera belittles the proletarian strategy for armed revolution in capitalist countries as forged by the Bolsheviks. Quote, the plan to dogmatically repeat what they conceive as the October Path of Lenin more than 100 years later, and against an enemy that has studied insurrection and how to beat it for just as long, as some kind of surprise attack, is extremely naive. End quote. In short, Kinera believes that the all wise enemy, quote, has studied Bolshevik style insurrection and how to beat it, end quote. but in the same breath agrees with counterinsurgency expert Marx that, quote, guerrilla warfare is universally applicable, end quote. On a militarized communist party. What exactly is meant by a militarized communist party? Does it mean that the principle of democratic centralism, which applies to the essentially civilian and voluntary membership of a CP, will be replaced by a military command structure and its concomitant military law and military discipline? If so, that would be a monstrous distortion of the principles of proletarian party life, and would reflect an extreme case of purely military viewpoint or militarism. Or does a militarized communist party simply mean that the party operates underground outside of base areas and that party members are encouraged to learn military work, e.g. be familiar with guns and work in tight teamwork with near military discipline? But CPs that lead armed struggles are already expected to adopt such methods, yet have no need to enshrine it as a principle on the same level as the name Communist Party or Bolshevized Party and the practice of democratic centralism. If the term simply means that CPs cannot viably combine open and underground channels of work, legal and illegal methods, but must choose one or the other to either be militarized or be guilty of legalism, then Kinera is an infantile brat whose coloring pens are limited to blacks and whites. on protracted preparations for armed revolution in capitalist countries. Sison rightfully says, quote, The term people's war may be flexibly used to mean the necessary armed revolution by the people to overthrow the bourgeois state in an industrial capitalist country. But definitely, what ought to be protracted is the preparation for the armed revolution with the overwhelming participation of the people, end quote. He explains, in his various writings, about the need for a strategy for accumulating strength through the legal mass movement combined with underground methods when objective conditions for armed struggle do not exist. In fact, it was by such Bolshevik strategy that Lenin greatly contributed to that powered the two 1917 Russian revolutions to victory, and which he brilliantly expounded at the tactical level in his work Left-Wing Communism, as applicable to many other capitalist countries during the Comintern period prior to World War II. Kinera accuses those proletarian revolutionaries in capitalist countries who are patiently accumulating strength in the Leninist way, which he labels Western accumulationists, including Sison, as, quote, opposed to people's war, but posing as revolutionary, end quote, as practicing reformism and legalism. He rejects, quote, the line of accumulation of forces through protracted legal struggle, end quote, as just passively waiting for the necessary objective conditions to arrive. He rants, quote, no wonder we have waited for a long time, 
and by this method one could go on forever, were it not for the fact that imperialism is doomed. These people want to do revolution by doing everything but revolution, end quote. He complains, quote, protracted, very protracted preparation by all legal means, and sometime in the future, an armed revolution. It must be said again and again that this has never happened. Not in a hundred years has this happened, even though hundreds and thousands of groups and parties adhered to this strategy. And the practice of these groups and tendencies has always been more or less identical to the practice of the openly reformist forces, end quote. In short, Kinera disdains the work in reactionary trade unions and bourgeois parliaments that Lenin, in left-wing communism and other works, had so patiently explained as an important part of revolutionary tasks during a non-revolutionary period. Kinera disdains the very essence of mass line and painstaking mass work that Mao had so consistently reminded communists to practice. He disdains the patient work of accumulating strength because he is too short-sighted to see its connection and eventual result in people's war. He wants people's war on the agenda, but is too impatient to build the strength needed to wage one in the future. He wants to see people's war now. And yet, when Sison asks Kinera to show what the so-called Maoist champions of PPW and capitalist countries have achieved so far, the latter could only shrug off the challenge with the cavalier remark, quote, we cannot really address the statement of no preparations being made. This might be true. It might not. If anyone were to make such preparations, they should never tell Sison, since he feels obliged to inform the whole world of any such preparations and the seriousness of them, end quote. So much for, quote, not hiding our intent as communists, end quote, which he is so fond of invoking. Sison's remark about not seeing, quote, any Maoist party proclaiming and actually starting, end quote, PPW in imperialist countries was obviously to show that truly serious Maoist formations in these countries see such course of immediate action as not viable for now. Kinera's response to this is dishonest and disingenuous. He basically challenges Sison to publicly reveal, quote, any Maoist party not adhering to the strategy of people's war and being of such quantity and quality, end quote, note that he dropped the word protracted. This is a cunning trap. Kinera rejects the so-called strategy of protracted legal accumulation to the brink of crisis and revolution in capitalist countries as an old strategy, and chides Sison of being, quote, never tired of the protracted legal accumulation of forces, in weight and want of the cataclysm, end quote, of crisis but he doesn't produce any arguments that show why such strategy is incorrect. He simply condemns it as, quote, the totally dominating strategy, end quote, of practically all left forces in Europe, including those that, quote, adhere to Mao Zedong thought, end quote, but not Gonzaloites. This shows that Kinera is a hopeless infantile sectarian who cannot even derive good points of tactical unity with other revolutionaries and progressives, who do not kowtow to Gonzalo thought. Conflating the 1905 and 1917 Russian revolutions into 15 years of armed activity. Kinera tries to prove the applicability of PPW in capitalist countries by conflating the three Russian revolutions into one. Quote, The armed struggle of Russia in 1917 cannot be mentioned without also bringing forward the failed revolution of 1905. This was pretext to 1917, and the war lasted to 1921 over a span of 15 years, where there was a lot of armed activity not only in 1905 and 1917, end quote. In short, he conflates the three Russian revolutions into, quote, a span of 15 years, end quote, during which there was, quote, a lot of armed activity, end quote, ergo supposedly long years of armed struggle. Kinera thus dishonestly conjures an illusion of a continuous PPW in a capitalist country. He conveniently forgets about the years of reaction, 1907 to 1910, when the revolution was in full retreat, and the years of revival, 1910 to 1914, when the Bolsheviks pursued tactics combining illegal work, but not yet armed struggle, with the 
obligatory utilization of many legal channels, including winning seats in the reactionary parliament. Kinera says nothing about the waves of favorable objective conditions that underlay both 1905 and 1917, including the Russo-Japanese War, World War I, and the ensuing severe crises. In doing so, he also belittles the patient process of accumulating strength in the open, and therefore essentially legal, workers' movement, as well as in the underground, before the said crises, which took many years and which resulted in economic and political strikes and the emergence of the Soviets prior to the actual armed mass uprisings. On the Size of the Industrial Proletariat in Advanced Countries Kinera responds to Sison's explanation on differences of class composition between capitalist and semi-feudal countries, which underlies revolutionary strategy and tactics, in this way. Quote, We must ask ourselves, what countries is Sison speaking of? There is no country in Europe, or North America at least, where the industrial proletariat is the majority. End quote. Again, Kinera is confused. Sison was clearly comparing the size of main productive classes in feudal vis-à-vis -vis modern or industrial capitalist countries. In that regard, the industrial proletariat is indeed the majority class in capitalist countries compared to the peasantry. The peasantry, in turn, remains the majority class in feudal or semi-feudal countries, especially if other rural semi-proletarians outside direct farming occupations are added up. Kinera claims that, quote, those employed in public or private services outnumber the industrial proletarians in most imperial countries, end quote. He must be reminded that the modern industrial proletariat includes such service workers, insofar as their class situation is most analogous to industrial workers. They also do not own any industrial means of production, their income comes from the sale of labor power to the capitalists, and their role in services also involves operating powered and automated machinery for mass-producing commodities, although in the form of services and not discrete material goods. Apparently, Kinera automatically excludes from the industrial proletariat those sizable working masses employed in major service firms in transport and storage, communications and media, health, and so on. There is no such class as service proletariat, mechanically separate from the modern industrial proletariat, as if they are boxed off from the intense class struggles and the aspirations for socialism. If at all, the bulk of workers in service industries are a powerful motive force for revolution, if only an ML or MLM party takes serious notice and conducts painstaking social investigation, mass work, and union-based economic and political mass struggles among them. On winning the battle for democracy. Sison explains, quote, Even if the material foundation for socialism exists in capitalism, the proletariat must first defeat fascism, thus winning the battle for democracy before socialism can triumph, end quote. He was actually anticipating the convulsions of capitalist crises and the rise of fascism, which impels all proletarian revolutionaries to prepare for future armed conflict, even prior to the actual socialist revolution. This was, in fact, the scenario that led the communist-led forces waging extensive partisan warfare in Europe during World War II and even earlier during the Spanish Civil War. Incongruously, however, Kinera goes ballistic and immediately screams about errors of revisionism and peaceful transition from capitalism to socialism. It was Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, 1948, who first expressed the proletariat's first revolutionary task in this manner. Quote, We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degree, all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e. of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible, 
end quote. This concept, quote, winning the battle for democracy, end quote, must be seen in multiple but related contexts. First, in the context of 19th century Europe, the proletarian movement had to fight for bourgeois democracy as part of its first attempts to gain and exercise political power, as was shown during the 1848 revolutions. Later, and especially after the 1871 Paris Commune, Marx and Engels concluded that, quote, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes, end quote, but had to smash the existing state machinery. Still, they continued to uphold the democratic republic as the best form for the proletarian dictatorship that would implement socialist democracy as a thousand times more democratic than bourgeois democracy. At the same time, in many countries with substantial vestiges of feudalism and autocracy, they saw the need for the proletariat to lead and complete the bourgeois democratic revolution as a prelude to the proletarian socialist revolution. Finally, since imperialism also brought forth the conditions of fascism and inter-imperialist war, it presented a still broader arena for the proletariat to lead all democratic forces in anti-fascist and anti-imperialist wars as a prelude to, or as an extra dimension of, socialist revolution. In this regard, Sison mentions the possibility of, quote, organizing proletarians with firearms, end quote, for sport, community self-defense, voluntary security, as one of many legal ways of preparing the advanced masses in capitalist countries for armed struggle, which is very different from immediately waging armed struggle. He mentioned, quote, current constitutional and legal standards, end quote, as one of many considerations in openly acquiring arms. This question, in fact, becomes an increasingly popular issue nowadays, given the rapid rise of violent, even armed, neo-Nazi and ultra-rightist movements in Europe and North America, and the need for a clear-cut proletarian call for combating fascism on all fronts. But here Canera turns ballistic again. He argues about, quote, strict gun laws in Europe, end quote, which of course was not Sison's point. He also wrongly associates Sison's ideas with the creation of Russian workers' militia, which emerged in the extremely revolutionary situation of 1917 and certainly was not just Trotsky's idea, but incorporated into the Bolshevik program. The Red Guards were a creation of the Bolsheviks and the masses, not Kinera's idol Trotsky. These are all opportunities for the proletariat to arm itself and seize power when the conditions are ripe, and make the necessary but calibrated or discreet preparations prior. But Kinera doesn't see the underlying Marxist-Leninist logic. He is singularly obsessed with the template of PBW, as synthesized by Gonzalo, needing to be implemented now. Anything outside the template is branded as revisionism, reformism, or legalism. on other pertinent matters. Like a hyperactive puppy, Kinera's debating style is to seize on certain phrases he doesn't like linguistically, to tug on bits of ideas that he relishes, and to chew on them until the whole thing turns into a sorry, senseless mess. Then he barks at Sison for the sorry, senseless mess. Kinera throws a temper tantrum when Sison describes the claim about, quote, the universality of Mao's theory of protracted people's war, end quote, as a mere, quote, notion of some people, end quote. He even complains of Sison's use of the terms proletarian revolutionaries and the party of the proletariat instead of communists and the communist party. The two sets of terms are synonymous, or at least near equivalent, if one is not misled by pseudo-communists fixating themselves on a few terms and merely waving the communist party banner but Kinera the nitpicker just has to have his snide comments in edgewise. Kinera repeatedly accuses Sison of being opportunist, of wiggling through the narrowest of cracks, of running from the two-line struggle, and of using dishonest methods of debate, just because his infantile mind doesn't get Sison's main points as well as nuanced handling of the issues at hand. He is enraged that Sison's two articles do not name anyone, 
or even briefly name the Partido Comunista de Peru, or quote, quote, at least some of their documents, end quote. When Sison reminds readers that a communist party needs to take its clandestine tactics and underground methods seriously, and not publicly declare its intent to commence warfare or to build a people's army, quote, before the conditions are ripe for armed revolution, end quote, Quinera labels Sison as an opportunist and launches into a sanctimonious lecture on the famous dictum and the Communist Manifesto. Quote, the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. End quote. This guy's too funny, if not too much of a nitwit. Quinera and his group Tien Folket lack self awareness and self criticalness. Since 1998, which is more than 21 years ago, they have not advanced to form a pre party formation and have not become a revolutionary party of the proletariat or a communist party to lead the proletariat and people in any kind of armed revolution. Their protracted talk about PPW has not yet proven to be any different from the illusion of the social democratic and other reformists about the protracted evolution of capitalism to socialism. Despite their mantra of PPW, they have not done anything to start any kind of people's war in Norway or assist such war, if any, in some other industrial capitalist country, or give any significant kind of help to the people's wars going on somewhere else in the world. They still need to grow from their small group status and infantile mentality by doing serious mass work among the Norwegian workers and engaging in truly MLM party building to be able to contribute more significantly to the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution against imperialism, revisionism, and all reaction. On Real and Fake Maoism But enough of Kinera's capers. Let us end with the most serious question of principle. Kinera idolizes Gonzalo to high heavens for his role in synthesizing Maoism, Quote, Maoism was comprehensed only through the People's War in Peru and that the PCP was the only Maoist party in the world in 1982, end quote. Quote, the content of Maoism was not clearly stated before 1982 and then only by the PCP, end quote. Quote, it is well known that when Maoism was synthesized for the very first time, it was done by Chairman Gonzalo and the Communist Party of Peru. This was finalized by the party in 1982 in the midst of People's War. End quote. These incredibly arrogant claims by Quinera, following his idol Gonzalo, is a brazen insult to Mao, who after his death apparently needed another thinker to quote, synthesize for the very first time end quote, his well known teachings and to pin on it the shiny new name Maoism. It is a historic slap at the Chinese Communist Party which, up to 1976, was led by Mao himself, together with other proletarian revolutionaries, and which was guided by Mao's theories, which was called Mao Zedong Thought and eventually Maoism. Mao's selected works, his many other writings and CCP documents ascribed to him, and unpublished talks representing his immense contribution to Marxist-Leninist theory and revolutionary practice, have been in wide circulation outside China since the 1950s. These have been studied by countless proletarian revolutionaries in many countries, have been applied to various conditions, and have inspired and helped guide many people's wars and internal rectification movements. Mao's works, and the theories of Maoism that run through them, remain publicly available for every serious revolutionary activist to study and grasp. Kinera's claim that the PCP was, quote, the only Maoist party in the world in 1982, end quote, is a blatant lie, if only because the Communist Party of the Philippines had already been re-established earlier, in 1968, on the basis of its founding cadre's firm grasp of Maoist theory and its application to concrete Philippine conditions. In Rectify Errors and Rebuild the Party, a major CPP document of the re-establishment issued in 1968, Mao Zedong thought was already repeatedly and correctly described as the acme of Marxism-Leninism in the current world era. The CPP has been assiduously building itself and achieving victories in People's War on the basis of MLM since then, as its voluminous documents, publications, and study courses show. 
Kinera and his kind of infantile communists are grossly ignorant of the pronouncements of the Chinese Communist Party under the leadership of Mao since the onset of the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution in 1966. Far ahead of Gonzalo, the Chinese Communists have upheld the theory and practice of continuing revolution under proletarian dictatorship through cultural revolution in order to combat modern revisionism, prevent the restoration of capitalism, and consolidate socialism. They have considered the Cultural Revolution as the greatest and most original contribution of Mao to the development of Marxism-Leninism and the guarantee for imperialism heading for total collapse and socialism marching towards world victory in the next 50 to 100 years from 1969. They have regarded the Cultural Revolution as the hallmark of the third stage in the development of Marxism and as surpassing his major contributions in philosophy, political economy, social science, rectification movement in party building, and people's war. Despite his great theoretical and practical revolutionary achievements, Mao was modest enough to resist the superlative titles, except teacher, being addressed to him by his comrades. It took some time for the comrades to gradually modify the reference to Mao's theoretical work from Mao's thinking to Mao Zedong thought, with a small t, and finally to Mao Zedong thought, with a big t. The significant content and consequences of Mao's theory and practice were already summed up and recognized upon his death in 1976. It is laudable if indeed in 1982, Gonzalo was the very first to transcribe Mao Zedong thought to Maoism. It is another matter whether his supposed synthesis of Maoism would surpass the summing up by Mao's own loyal Chinese comrades. By itself, the transcription from Mao Zedong thought to Maoism is not a great achievement. Marx berated Paul Lafargue in 1883 for using the term Marxism for revolutionary phrase-mongering against the struggle for reforms. Even then, Karl Kautsky popularized the term Marxism and subsequently used it to deny the Marxist character of Lenin's theory and practice, which he termed as Leninism. To differentiate Maoism from Mao Zedong thought, is to nitpick and invent a false distinction. Even Gonzalo used the phrase Mao Zedong thought until 1982. Whichever term is used, we certainly have no need for the dubious genius of a Gonzalo to comprehense or synthesize or canonize or reinvent it anew for the world's benefit. He could not have added to the achievements of Mao himself after his death in 1976. It is pure nonsense to make it appear that the continuous significance and consequentiality of Mao's theory and practice depend on the words of Gonzalo. On Gonzalo's Revolutionary and Opportunist Record The infantile or pseudo-Maoists characteristically use such expressions as Maoism and Gonzalo thought to browbeat other people or trample on others as revisionists and opportunists without the concrete analysis of concrete circumstances and issues. As dogmatists and sectarians of the worst kind, they use such expressions as, quote, Gonzalo is the greatest after Mao, end quote, sounding like evangelists who proclaim Jesus is the Lord. Mistaking struggle mania for revolutionary struggle, they are quick to throw invectives and do not really engage in a serious substantive debate. Gonzalo thought as painted by Canera, is not ideology, but ideology. Canera and his fellow dogmatists and sectarians are incapable of recognizing the egotism, immodesty, and arrogance of certain leaders who wish to proclaim their universal greatness even before winning the revolution in their own country, and who actually brand their own theories and practices with their own names, like Gonzalo Thought, Prachanda Path, and Avakian Synthesis to proclaim himself the great leader of the new wave after MLM. Let us focus on the idol of Quinera. Gonzalo may be praised for founding the PCP, Sendero Luminoso, in 1969 under the guidance of Mariategui and Mao Zedong thought. But despite his belief that people's war can be started at the drop of a hat, Quinera does not take Gonzalo to task for being a sluggard, starting the people's war only in 1980, 11 years after the PCP-SL founding. 
so different from the CP of the Philippines being founded on December 26, 1968, and starting the People's War on March 29, 1969, three months after the CPP founding. Despite his gross failures at building the United Front as a political weapon from 1969 to 1992, Gonzalo may still be praised for engaging in the building of the party and the People's Guerrilla Army up to the late 1980s, when, without respect for the facts of the revolutionary armed struggle, he invented the illusion of strategic equilibrium and proceeded to seek a left opportunist shortcut to victory through urban insurrection. Inasmuch as he abhors stages, Kinera can praise Gonzalo for disregarding the probable stages in the development of protracted people's war as previously defined by Mao. But Gonzalo is a gross violator of Mao's teachings on protracted people's war. After his capture in 1992, Gonzalo was quick to capitulate to the Fujimori regime and become a right opportunist by offering peace negotiations and peace agreement with the regime, causing costly splits among the members and supporters of the PCP-SL. Since then, the infantile Maoists have made a blanket denial of Gonzalo's capitulation and right opportunism, despite subsequent manifestations of the truth since 1993, such as his public TV appearance, confirmation by his wife, and testimonies of his lawyer who visited him weekly. On this basis, Rim started to become critical of Gonzalo's behavior. Notwithstanding his flip-flop from left opportunism to right opportunism, which has caused the People's War to decline in nearly total defeat in Peru, Gonzalo deserves compassion for having been imprisoned for more than 27 years, and for having suffered so many violations of human rights. The campaign to seek amnesty and release from prison deserves support and international solidarity, provided he does not call on the Peruvian revolutionaries to surrender and stop the People's War, even under the revisionist pretense that the People's War can be resumed after his genius or great thought becomes available in the battlefield.